This is The Glass Castle, pages 226 to 241. As you read today, continue thinking about how the children assert their independence in this section of the text. Page 226. As spring approached and the day of Lori's graduation drew closer, I lay awake at night, thinking about her life in New York City. In exactly three months, I said to her, you'll be living in New York. The following week, I said, in exactly two months and three weeks, you'll be living in New York. Would you please shut up? She said. You're not nervous, are you? I asked. What do you think? Lori was terrified. She was not sure what she was supposed to do once she got to New York. That had always been the vaguest part of our escape plan. Back in the fall, I'd had no doubt that she could get a scholarship to one of the city's universities. She'd been a finalist for a National Merit Scholarship, but she'd had to hitchhike into Bluefield to take the test, and she got rattled when the trucker, who picked her up, put the moves on her. She arrived nearly an hour late and botched the test. Mom, who supported Lori's New York plans and kept saying she wished she were going to the big city herself, suggested that Lori apply to the Cooper Union Art School. Lori put together a portfolio of her drawings and paintings, but just before the submissions deadline, she spilled a pot of coffee on them, which made Mom wonder aloud if Lori had a fear of success. Then, Lori heard about a scholarship sponsored by a literary society for the student who created the best work of art inspired by one of the geniuses of the English language. She decided to make a clay bust of Shakespeare. She worked on it for a week, using a sharpened popsicle stick to shape the slightly bulging eyes and the goatee and earring and longish hair. When it was finished, it looked exactly like Shakespeare. That night, we were all sitting at the drafting table watching Lori put the final touches on Shakespeare's hair when Dad came home drunk. That does indeed resemble old Billy, Dad said. Only thing is, as I've been telling you, he was a goddamn fake. For years, every time Mom brought out Shakespeare's plays... Dad would carry on about how they'd been written not by William Shakespeare of Avon, but by a bunch of people, including someone named the Earl of Oxford, because no single person in Elizabethan England could have had Shakespeare's 30,000-word vocabulary. All this bunk about little Billy Shakespeare, Dad would say, the great genius, despite his grammar school education, his small Latin and less Greek, was a lot of sentimental mythology. You're helping perpetuate this fraud, he told Laurie. Dad, it's just a bust, Lori said. That's the problem, Dad said. He studied the sculpture, then suddenly reached over and smeared off Shakespeare's mouth with his thumb. What the hell are you doing? Lori cried out. It's no longer just a bust, Dad said. Now it has symbolic value. You can call it mute bard. I spent days on that, Lori shouted, and you've ruined it. I elevated it, Dad said. He told Lori he would help her write a paper that would demonstrate that Shakespeare's plays had multiple authors, like Rembrandt's paintings. By God, you'll set the literary world on edge, he said. I don't want to set the world on edge, Lori screamed. I just want to win a stupid little scholarship. God damn it, you're in a horse race, but you're thinking like a sheep, Dad said. Sheep don't win horse races. Lori didn't have the spirit to rework the bust. The next day, she smushed the clay into a big glob and left it on the drafting table. I told Lori that if she hadn't been accepted into an art school by the time she graduated, she should go to New York anyway. She could support herself with the money we'd saved up until she found a job, and then she could apply to a school. That became our new plan. Everyone was mad at Dad, which gave him a case of the sulks. He said he didn't know why he even bothered to come home anymore since he no longer got the slightest bit of appreciation for his ideas. He insisted he wasn't trying to keep Lori from leaving for New York, but if she had the sense that God gave a goose, she would stay put. New York is a sorry-ass sinkhole, he said more than once, filled with faggots and rapists. She'd get mugged and find herself on the streets, he warned, forced into prostitution and winding up like a drug addict, like all those runaway teenagers. I'm only telling you this because I love you, he said, and I don't want to see you hurt. One evening in May, when we'd been saving our money for almost nine months, I came home with a couple of dollars I'd made babysitting and went into the bedroom to stash them in Oz. The pig was not on the old sewing machine. I began looking through all the junk in the bedroom and finally found Oz on the floor. Someone had slashed him apart with a knife and stolen all the money. I knew it was Dad, but at the same time, I couldn't believe he'd stoop this low. Lori obviously didn't know yet. She was in the living room humming away as she worked on a poster. My first impulse was to hide Oz. I had this wild thought that I could somehow replace the money before Lori discovered it was missing. 
but I knew how ridiculous that was. Three of us had spent the better part of a year accumulating the money. It would be impossible for me to replace it in the month before Lori graduated. I went into the living room and stood beside her, trying to think of what to say. She was working on a poster that said Tammy in day-glow letters. After a moment, she looked up. What? she said. Lori could tell by my face that something was wrong. She stood up so abruptly, she knocked over a bottle of India ink, ran into the bedroom. I braced myself, expecting to hear a scream, but there was only silence, and then a small, broken whimpering. Lori stayed up all night to confront Dad, but he didn't come home. She skipped school the following day in case he returned, but Dad was AWOL for three days before we heard him climbing the rickety staircase to the porch. You bastard, Lori shouted. You stole our money. What the goddamn hell are you talking about? Dad asked. And watch your language. He leaned against the door and lit a cigarette. Lori held up the slashed pig and threw it as hard as she could at Dad, but it was empty and nearly weightless. It struck his shoulder lightly, then bounced to the floor. He bent down carefully, as if the floor beneath him could shift at any moment, picked up our ravaged piggy bank, and turned it over in his hands. Someone sure is how gutted old Oz, didn't they? He turned to me. Jeanette, do you know what happened? He was actually half grinning at me. After the whipping, Dad had jacked up the charm with me, and even though I was planning to leave, he could make me laugh when he tried, and he still considered me an ally. But now, I wanted to knock him over the head. You took our money, I said. That's what happened. Well, don't that beat all, Dad said. He started going on about how a man comes home from slaying dragons, trying to keep his family safe, and all he wants in return for his toil and sacrifice is a little love and respect, but it seemed these days that was just too damn much to ask for. He said he didn't take our New York money, but if Lori was hell-bent on living in that cesspool, he'd finance her trip himself. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a few wadded dollar bills. We just stared at him, so he let the crumpled money fall to the floor. Suit yourself, he said. Why are you doing this to us, Dad? I asked. Why? His face tightened with anger. Then he staggered to the sofa bed and passed out. I'll never get out of here, Lori kept saying. I'll never get out of here. You will, I said. I swear it. I believe she would, because I knew that if Lori never got out of Welch, neither would I. I went back to J.C. Murphy the other day and stared at the shelf of piggy banks. They were all either plastic or porcelain or glass, easily broken. I studied a collection of metal boxes with locks and keys. The hinges were too flimsy. Dad could pry them apart. I bought a blue change purse. I wore it on a belt under my clothes at all times. When it got too full, I put the money in a sock that I hid in a hole in the wall below my bunk. We started saving again. But Lori felt too defeated to paint much, and the money didn't come in as quickly. A week before school was out, we had only $37.20 in the sock. Then, one of the women I'd been babysitting for, a teacher named Mrs. Sanders, told me she and her family were moving back to their hometown in Iowa and asked if I wanted to spend the summer with them there. If I came along and helped look after her two toddlers, she said she'd pay me $200 at the end of the summer and buy me a bus ticket back to Welch. I thought about her offer. Take Lori instead of me, I said. And at the end of the summer, buy her a bus ticket to New York City. Mrs. Sanders agreed. Low-lying pewter-colored clouds rested on the mountaintops around Welch on the morning of Lori's departure. They were there most mornings, and when I noticed them, they reminded me of how isolated and forgotten the town was. A sad, lost place, adrift in the clouds. The clouds usually burned away by mid-morning, when the sun climbed above the steep hills, but some days, like the one Lori left, they clung to the mountains, and a fine mist formed in the valley that turned your hair and face damp. When the Sanders family pulled up in their station wagon, Lori was ready. She had packed her clothes, her favorite books, and her art supplies in a single cardboard box. She hugged all of us except Dad. She had refused to speak a word to him since he plundered Oz, promised to write, and climbed into the station wagon. We all stood watching as the car disappeared down Little Hobart Street. Lori never once looked back. I took that as a good sign. When I climbed the staircase to the house, Dad was standing on the porch, smoking a cigarette. This family is falling apart, he said. It sure is, I told him. Page 231. That fall, when I was going into the 10th grade, 
Miss Bevins made me news editor of the Maroon Wave. After working as a proofreader in the 7th grade, I had started laying out pages in the 8th grade, and in ninth grade, I began reporting and writing articles and taking pictures. Mom had bought a Minolta camera to take pictures of her pictures, so she could send them to Lori, who could show them around art galleries in New York. When Mom wasn't using it, I wore the Minolta everywhere, because you never knew when you'd see something newsworthy. What I loved most about calling myself a reporter was that it gave me an excuse to show up any place. Since I'd never made a lot of friends in Welch, I hardly ever went to the school's football games or dances or rallies. I felt awkward sitting by myself when everyone else was with friends. But when I was working for The Wave, I had a reason to be there. I was on assignment, a member of the working press, with my notepad in hand and the Minolta around my neck. I began going to just about every extracurricular event at the school, and the kids who shunned me before now accepted me and even sought me out, posing and clowning in hopes of getting their pictures in the paper. As someone who could make them famous among their peers, I was no longer a person to be trifled with. Even though the wave came out only once a month, I worked on it every day. Instead of hiding in the bathroom during lunch hour, I spent it in Miss Bevins's classroom, where I wrote my articles, edited the stories written by other students, and counted the letters and headlines to make sure they fit in the columns. I finally had a good excuse for why I never ate lunch. I'm on a deadline, I'd say. I also stayed after school to develop my photographs in the darkroom, and that had a hidden benefit. I could sneak into the cafeteria once everyone had left and dig through the garbage pails. I'd find industrial-sized cans of corn that were nearly full and huge containers of coleslaw and tapioca pudding. I no longer had to root through the bathroom wastebaskets for food, and I hardly ever went hungry again. When I was a junior, Miss Bevins made me the editor-in-chief, though the job was supposed to go to a senior. Only a handful of students wanted to work for the wave, and I ended up writing so many of the articles that I abolished bylines. It looked a little ridiculous having my name appear four times on the front page. The paper cost 15 cents, and I sold it myself, going from class to class and standing in the hallways, hawking it like a newsboy. Welch High had about 1,200 students, but we sold only a couple hundred copies of the paper. I tried various schemes to boost the circulation. I held poetry competitions, added a fashion column, and wrote controversial editorials, including one questioning the validity of standardized tests, which provoked an irate letter from the head of the State Department of Education. Nothing worked. One day, a student I was trying to get to buy the wave told me he had no use for it because the same names appeared in the paper again and again, the school's athletes and cheerleaders, and the handful of kids known as slide rules who always won the academic prizes. So, I started a column called Birthday Corner, listing the names of the 80 or so people who had their birthday in the coming month. Most of these people had never appeared in the paper, and they were so excited to see their names in print, they bought several copies. Circulation doubled. Miss Bevins wondered aloud if Birthday Corner represented serious journalism. I told her I didn't care. It sold papers. Chuck Yeager visited Welch High that year. I'd been hearing about Chuck Yeager all my life from Dad, about how he'd been born in West Virginia, in the town of Myra, on the Mud River, over in Lincoln County, about how he joined the Air Force during World War II and had shot down 11 German planes by the time he was 22, about how he became a test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base high up on the Mojave Desert in California, and about how one day in 1947 he became the first man to break the sound barrier in his X-1, even though the night before, he had been up drinking and had been thrown from a horse and cracked some ribs. Dad would never admit to having heroes, but the brass-balled, liquor-loving, coolly calculating Chuck Yeager was the one man in the world he admired above all others. When he heard that Chuck Yeager was giving a speech at Wel Welch High, and that he'd agreed to let me interview him afterward, Dad could hardly contain his excitement. He was waiting on the porch for me with a pen and paper when I got home from school the day before the big interview. He sat down to help me draw up a list of intelligent questions so I wouldn't embarrass myself in front of this greatest of West Virginia's native sons. What was going through your head when you first broke Mach 1? What was going through your head when A. Scott Crossfield broke Mach 2? What is your favorite aircraft? What are your thoughts on the feasibility of flying at the speed of light? 
Dad wrote up about 25 or 30 questions like that, and then insisted we rehearse the interview. He pretended to be Chuck Yeager and gave me detailed answers to the questions he'd written out. His eyes got misty as he described what it was like to break the sound barrier. Then he decided I needed some solid grounding in aviation history, and he stayed up half the night briefing me by the light of a kerosene lamp on the test flight program, basic aerodynamics, and the Austrian physicist Ernst Mach. The next day, Mr. Jack, the principal, introduced Chuck Yeager during assembly in the auditorium. He looked more like a cowboy than a West Virginian, with his horseman's gait and his lean, leathery face, but as soon as he started speaking, his voice was pure Apollo. As he talked, the fidgety students settled into their folding chairs and became enraptured by the legendary, world-traveled man who told us how proud he was of his West Virginia roots, and how we, too, should be proud of these roots, roots we all shared, and how, regardless of where we came from, each and every one of us could and should follow our dreams, just as he had followed his. When he finished talking, the applause about shattered the glass in the windows. I climbed up on the stage before the students filed out. Mr. Yeager, I said, holding out my hand. I'm Jeanette Walls with the Maroon Wave. Chuck Yeager shook my hand and grinned. Just spell my name right, ma'am, he said, so as my kin will know who you're writing about. We sat down on some folding chairs and talked for nearly an hour. Mr. Yeager took every question seriously and acted like he had all the time in the world for me. When I mentioned various aircraft he'd flown, the aircraft Dad had briefed me about, he grinned again and said, Heck, I do believe we got an aviation expert on our hands. In the hallways afterward, the other kids kept coming up to tell me how lucky I was. What was he really like? they asked. What did he say? Everyone treated me with a deference according only to the school's top athletes. Even the varsity quarterback caught my eye and nodded. I was the girl who had actually talked to Chuck Yeager. Dad was so eager to hear how the interview went that he was not only home when I got back from school, he was even sober. He insisted on helping me with the article to ensure its technical accuracy. I already had the lead figured out in my head. I sat down in front of Mom's Remington and typed it out. The pages of the history books came alive this month when Chuck Yeager, the man who first broke the sound barrier, visited Welch High. Dad looked over my shoulder. Great, he said, but let's juice it up a little. Page 235. Lori had been writing to us regularly from New York. She loved it there. She was living in a hotel for women in Greenwich Village, working as a waitress in a German restaurant, and taking art classes and even fencing lessons. She'd met the most fascinating group of people, every one of them a weird genius. People in New York loved art and music so much, she said, that artists sold paintings right on the sidewalk next to the string quartets playing Mozart. Even Central Park wasn't as dangerous as people in West Virginia thought. On the weekends, it was filled with roller skaters and frisbee players and jugglers and mimes with their faces painted white. She knew I'd love it there once I got there. I knew it, too. Ever since I'd started 11th grade, I'd been counting off the months, 22 of them, until I would join Lori. I had my plan worked out. Once I graduated from high school, I'd move to New York, enroll at a city college, and then get a job with AP or UPI, the wire services whose stories unspooled from the Welch Daily News teletype machines, or with one of the famous New York papers. I'd overhear the reporters at the Welch Daily News make jokes to one another about the highfalutin writers who worked at those papers. I was determined to become one. In the middle of my junior year, I went to Miss Katona, the high school guidance counselor, to ask for the names of colleges in New York. Miss Katona lifted the glasses that dangled from a cord around her neck and peered at me through them. Bluefield State was only 36 miles away, she said, and with my grades, I could probably get a full scholarship. I want to go to college in New York, I said. Miss Katona gave me a puzzled frown. Whatever for? That's where I want to live. Miss Katona said that in her view, this was a bad idea. It was easier to go to college in the state where you had attended high school. You were considered in-state, which meant acceptance was more likely and tuition was cheaper. I thought about this for a minute. Maybe I should move to New York City right now and graduate from high school there. Then I'd be considered in-state. Miss Katona squinted at me. But you live here, she said. This is your home. Miss Katona was a fine bone woman who always wore button-up sweaters and stout shoes. She had gone to Welch High School, and it seemed not to have occurred to her to live anywhere else. 
to leave West Virginia, even to leave Welch, would have been unthinkably disloyal, like deserting your family. Just because I live here now, I said, doesn't mean I couldn't move. That would be a terrible mistake. You live here. Think of what you'd miss, your family and friends, and senior year is the highlight of your entire high school experience. You'd miss senior day. You'd miss the senior prom. I walked home slowly that evening, thinking over what Miss Katona had said. It was true that many grown-ups in Welch talked about how senior year in high school was the highlight of their lives. On senior day, something the school had set up to keep juniors from dropping out, the seniors wore funny clothes and got to skip classes. It was not exactly a compelling reason to stay on and watch for one more year. As for the senior prom, I had as much chance of getting a date as Dad did of ending corruption in the unions. I had been speaking hypothetically about moving to New York a year early, but as I walked, I realized that if I wanted to, I could up and go. I could really do it. Maybe not right now, not this minute. It was the middle of the school year, but I could wait until I finished 11th grade. By then I'd be 17. I had almost $100 saved, enough to get me started in New York. I could leave Welch in under five months. I got so excited that I started running. I ran, faster and faster, along the old road overhung with bare branched trees, then on to Grandview and up Little Hobart Street, past the barking yard dogs and the frost-covered coal piles, past the Nose House and the Parish's House, the Hall's House and the Renko's House, until, gasping for air, I came to a stop in front of our house. For the first time in years, I noticed my half-finished yellow paint job. I'd spent so much time in Welch trying to make things a little bit better, but nothing had worked. In fact, the house was getting worse. One of the supporting pillars was starting to buckle. The leak in the roof over Brian's bed had gotten so bad that when it rained, he slept under an inflatable raft Mom had won in the sweepstakes by sending in Benson and Hedges 100s packages that we dug out of trash cans. If I left, Brian could have my old bed. My mind was made up. I was going to New York City as soon as the school year was out. I clambered up the mountainside to the rear of the house. The stairs had completely rotted through, and climbed through the back window we now used as the door. Dad was at the drafting table, working on some calculations, and Mom was going through her stacks of paintings. When I told them about my plan, Dad stubbed out his cigarette, stood up, and climbed out the back window without saying a word. Mom nodded and looked down, dusting off one of her paintings, murmuring something to herself. So, what do you think? I asked. Fine, go. What's wrong? Nothing. You should go. It's a good plan. She seemed on the verge of tears. Don't be upset, Mom. All right. I'm not upset because I'll miss you, Mom said. I'm upset because you get to go to New York, and I'm stuck here. It's not fair. Lori, when I called her, approved of my plan. I could live with her, she said, if I got a job and chipped in on the rent. Brian liked my idea, too, especially when I pointed out that he could have my bed. He began making wisecracks in a lockjaw accent about how I was going to become one of those fur-wearing, pinky-extended, nose-in-the-air New Yorkers. He began counting down the weeks until I left, just as I had counted them down for Lori. In 16 weeks, you'll be in New York, he said. The next week, in three months and three weeks, you'll be in New York. Dad had barely spoken to me since I announced my decision. One night that spring, he came into the bedroom where I was up on my bunk studying. He had some papers rolled up under his arm. Got a minute to look at something? He asked. Sure. I followed him into the living room where he spread the papers on the drafting table. There were his old blueprints for the glass castle, all stained and dog-eared. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen them. We'd stopped talking about the glass castle once the foundation we dug was filled up with garbage. I think I finally worked out how to deal with the lack of sunlight on the hillside, Dad said. It involved installing specially curved mirrors in the solar cells, but what he wanted to talk to me about was the plans for my room. Now that Lori is gone, he said, I'm reconfiguring the layout and your room will be a lot bigger. Dad's hands trembled slightly as he unrolled different blueprints. He had drawn frontal views, side views, and aerial views of the glass castle. He had diagrammed the wiring and the plumbing. He had drawn the interiors of rooms and labeled them and specified their dimensions, down to the inches, in his precise, blocky handwriting. I stared at the plans. Dad, I said, you'll never build the glass castle. Are you saying you don't have faith in your old man? Even if you do, I'll be gone. In less than three months, I'm leaving for New York City. 
What I was thinking was, you don't have to go right away, Dad said. I could stay and graduate from Welch High and go to Bluefield State, as Miss Katona had suggested, then get a job at the Welch Daily News. He'd help me with the articles, like he'd help me with my piece on Chuck Yeager. And I'll build the glass castle, I swear it. We'll all live in it together. It'll be a hell of a lot better than any apartment you'll ever find in New York City. I can guarantee goddamn tea that. Dad, I said, as soon as I finish classes, I'm getting on the next bus out of here. If the buses stop running, I'll hitchhike. I'll walk if I have to. Go ahead and build the glass castle, but don't do it for me. Dad rolled up the blueprints and walked out of the room. A minute later, I heard him scrambling down the mountainside. Page 239. It had been a mild winter, and summer came early to the mountains. By late May, the wild bleeding hearts and the rhododendrons had bloomed, and the fragrance of honeysuckle drifted down the hillside and into the house. We had our first hot days before school was out. Those last couple of weeks, I'd go from feeling excited to nervous to just plain scared back to excited in a matter of minutes. On the last day of school, I cleaned out my locker and went to say goodbye to Miss Bevins. I've got a feeling about you, she said. I think you'll do all right up there. But you've left me with a problem. Who's going to edit the wave next year? You'll find someone, I'm sure. I've thought of trying to entice your brother into it. People might start thinking that the Walses are building a dynasty. Miss Bevan smiled. Maybe you are. At home that night, Mom cleaned out a suitcase she'd used for her collection of dancing shoes, and I filled it with my clothes and my bound copies of the Maroon Wave. I wanted to leave everything from the past behind, even the good things, so I gave Maureen my geode. It was dusty and dull, but I told her that if she scrubbed it hard, it would sparkle like a diamond. As I cleared out the box on the wall next to my bed, Brian said, Guess what? In one more day, you'll be in New York City. Then he started impersonating Frank Sinatra, singing New York, New York, off-key and doing his lounge lizard dance. Shut up, you big dummy, I said, and hit him hard on the shoulder. You're the dummy, he said, and hit me hard back. We tossed a few more punches and then looked at each other awkwardly. The one bus out of Welch left at 7.10 in the morning. I needed to be at the station before 7. Mom announced that since she was not by nature an early riser, she would not be getting up to see me off. I know what you look like and I know what the bus station looks like, she said. And those big farewells are so sentimental. I could hardly sleep that night. Neither could Brian. From time to time, he'd break the silence by announcing that in seven hours, I'd be leaving Welch. In six hours, I'd be leaving Welch, and we'd both start cracking up. I fell asleep only to be woken at first light by Brian, who, like Mom, wasn't an early riser. He was tugging at my arm. No more joking about it, he said. In two hours, you'll be gone. Dad hadn't come home that night, but when I climbed through the back window with my suitcase, I saw him sitting at the bottom of the stone steps, smoking a cigarette. He insisted on carrying the suitcase for me, and we set off down Little Hobart Street and around the old road. The empty streets were damp. Every now and then, Dad would look over at me and wink, or make a talking sound with his tongue, as if I was a horse and he was urging me on. It seemed to make him feel like he was doing what a father should, plucking up his daughter's courage, helping her face the terrors of the unknown. When we got to the station, Dad turned to me. Honey, life in New York may, may not be as easy as you think it's going to be. I can handle it, I told him. Dad reached into his pocket and pulled out his favorite jackknife, the one with the horn handle and the, bl the blade of blue German steel that we'd used for demon hunting. I'll feel better knowing you have this. He pressed the knife into my hand. The bus turned down the street and stopped with a hiss of compressed air in front of the trailway station. The driver opened up the luggage compartment and slid my suitcase in next to the others. I hugged Dad. When our cheeks touched, and I breathed in his smell of tobacco, vitalis, and whiskey, I realized he'd shave for me. If things don't work out, you can always come home, he said. I'll be here for you. You know that, don't you? I know. I knew that in his way, he would be. I also knew I'd never be coming back. Only a few passengers were on the bus, so I got a good seat next to the window. The driver closed the door and we pulled out. At first, I resolved not to turn around. I wanted to look ahead to where I was going, not back at what I was leaving. But then, I turned anyway. Dad was lighting a cigarette. I waved, and he waved back. Then, he shoved his hands in his pockets, the cigarette dangling from his mouth, and stood there, slightly stoop-shouldered and distracted-looking. 
I wondered if he was remembering how he, too, had left Welch full of vinegar at age 17, and just as convinced as I was now that he'd never return. I wondered if he was hoping that his favorite girl would come back, or if he was hoping that, unlike him, she would make it out for good. I reached into my pocket and touched the horn-handled jackknife, then waved again. Dad just stood there. He grew smaller and smaller, and then we turned a corner, and he was gone.